uh, you've seen the data encryption standard earlier. Uh, since then, there are many other ciphers, for example, the advanced encryption standard, which we will not miss and we will be mentioned later. Uh, but in order to show differential cryptanalysis and how this technique and possibly other techniques work, it's best to show it on the data encryption standard because they work much worse on the newer ciphers which were, that were uh, designed to withstand as much as possible against these techniques. Okay, so you've seen the data encryption standard just earlier, and you've seen that there are various kinds of operations in the key schedule and in the encryption itself. They are all but one linear, meaning the XOR operations are of course linear, the expansions are linear, the permutations of the order of bits are linear, and so on and so on, both in the F function in each round and in the combining function that takes, I'll show you, uh, that takes the output of the F function and combines to the other half, everything is linear. If all the cipher would be linear, it would mean that there is a linear function of a plain text that computes the cipher text. And this would mean that from one known plain text and its cipher text, we could find uh, the non-linear, the linear, uh, the missing linear value, which means multiply the plain text by some matrix as a vector by a matrix. This matrix is independent of the key and then XOR it with some 64-bit value which is key dependent and depends only on the key and the output will be the cipher text. So it's very easy to find. So, of course, the data encryption standard is not linear. We have the S-boxes. So we have input 32 bits of the F function in each round, expanded to 48 by duplicating some of the bits by a table that I'll show with you, XORing with the subkey of that round, K1, K2, and so on, and then six bits, the first six bits enter an S-box S1, which was chosen non-linearly, the next six bits S2 to S2 and so on, each S box outputs four bits. The order is permuted by some order, and this is the output of the function. So we, we see that everything is linear, but the S boxes. So, as we said, if everything would be linear, the cipher would not be a good one. And what forbids us from any problem? <laughs> so, the key does not allow us to guess what's the values in further rounds, because once the key is used in the F, F function in the first round, and then in the F function of the second round, and so on, we can't know what's, a, what's the value of any bit afterwards, because it's highly dependent on prior qubits. What we really want to know in order to make cryptanalysis is what's the values during computation somewhere in the middle of the encryption. Why? Because we know the value of the plain text, and we want to push this knowledge as much as we can towards the cipher text. If we know a value just in the last round or before the last round of encryption from the plaintext somehow 
magically, we could do various correlations between the ciphertext and the value we know and find bits of it. So we want to push it as, as much as we can. Uh, okay. So the idea here is the following. We, don't, we cannot do it on the values themselves. So we will look at pairs. We look at pairs instead of looking at one encryption. We will look, let's say that this is one encryption with some plain text P. We will look at two encryptions, meaning the same cipher twice, but with two plain texts. Let's call them P and P star. And we will ask what happens during computation. And we will not ask what happens with the values, the real values during encryption in both. We will ask what's the difference between them. So let's assume that we have here some value <coughs> x during encryption. Here it would be x, and on the other one it would be x star. We will ask what's the difference between them. And we will ask how these differences evolve during encryption. And I'll show you that it's much easier to know how differences evolve than how the values themselves evolve. We will not know the values there, we will know only the differences. So let's assume that we have P and P star. Let's call the difference between them P prime equals P x or P star. And for every x during encryption, we'll have x prime equals x, x or x star. Meaning, let's say that this x is the input to the f function in the third round. We'll ask, what's the difference there? Let's say it's the output of the f function of in the fourth round, or maybe the input to the S box S1 in the fifth round. We will want to know the differences. In terms of differences, you will see that all these linear operations are linear. If you take any operation that change order of bits or select bits or expand by duplicating bits, it's easy to see that the permutation of x, x or the permutation of x star due to the linearity, it's just the permutation over the input difference. So if difference is XOR, the XOR of both outputs is just the, per the same permutation computed over the input difference. And when we get to XOR, still due to linearity, the output difference, the difference of the two results, will be the XOR of both input differences. And when we go to the key, we find that the key disappears. Because if we have the difference between x, x, or k, and the other x, x, or the same k, because the key is the same of one, it's easily seen that k disappears, and the input difference in x is just the output difference, k disappears, and therefore, everything we'll see later does not involve the key. It's like key independent. So we all know it's not key independent because the key affects the real values that will later affect whether the differences are these or those or others. But from a high level view, the key disappears. So we are interested to know what happens for the S boxes because all other operations are easy. And we ask. We have two inputs to an S-box, meaning in two runs we have here some input to an S-box and there some input to an S-box. It's easy to know what's the difference in the input to the S-box and we'll ask what's the output difference from that S-box, meaning we had six input bits to which we know the difference. There are four output bits of which we want to know the difference. And we don't have such a function that in 100% of the times we'll have the same difference. We have, for each input difference, 
say 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 6 bits, we have 64 pairs, take any value, the other one will be the same x of this difference, and there are 16 possible output differences because there are 16, so there are 4 bits in the output. Therefore, we would expect that on average, each output difference will occur for about 4, 1 over 16, of the pairs, the possible pairs, the 64 possible pairs. So I'll show you, of course, there is one exception, easy exception. If the input difference is zero, the output difference must be zero. It's actually saying, if the two inputs are the same, the output, the two outputs must always be the same. So always for input difference zero, the output <coughs> difference must be zero. Same outputs. So I'll show you a table to which we'll call the difference distribution table of this box, for which the rows will be the input differences, the columns will be the output differences, and in the entries we will write how many of these 64 pairs with that input difference have that output difference. As of course we expect an average of four in each row, and therefore in the table, but look at this table. So let's see, the first row. Zero must be zero in the output, it's all the 64 are here, as we said earlier, all the rest of the row is zero. But you can see various numbers in the, in the rest of the table. For example, for the input difference 3, 4 in hexadecimal, meaning 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, if we look at the uh, 64 pairs that we have for this difference, we'll find that none of them will have zero output difference, meaning none of these 64 pairs have the same output in both runs, in both uh, values of the pair. But if we look here, we'll see that 16 of them will have output difference 2, meaning 0, 0, 1, 0. So if we look at this table, we'll see various numbers. You see 20 or 30 percent of the values here are 0. <coughs> On average, it's 4. You see 10s, 12s, 14 somewhere, even 16. There are a few 16s in uh, the uh, tables of the uh, S-boxes of deaths, but there are, you see one of them. This means that if I take, if I know for some reason that the input difference to this S-box in some round is 3, 4, I can guess with success probability 16 over, 20, over 64, meaning a quarter, that this is the output difference. I don't know anything on the key. But I would expect that this, with this probability, I will have this difference. And now, the whole trick now will be how to build, how to use all this knowledge to, to know as much as possible and the differences after the first round, better second round, third round, and if possible, the data after 13 rounds, 14 rounds, and so on. If we can get to the 15, we are done. But we lost something. We don't know anything for sure. It's probabilistic. Okay. Uh, we will call the probability of an entry from some difference to another is the value there over 64. And we can even define the probability for a full f function, which will be the product of the probabilities of the s-boxes uh, in, uh, in that round. Though, uh, now you will ask me questions about whether it's independent or not, and uh, it's, a, it's good questions, 
Uh, it will be a good question, as Ror said. There's slide somewhere I, I'll probably not show. Um, so we want to find differences with high probabilities. Meaning, zero to zero in most of the S-boxes are the best, but we can't do it in all the S-boxes, because if we do it in all the S-boxes, in all the rounds, this means that the two plain texts are the same, and if we have two same plain texts, there is no reason to encrypt it second time and make differences. <coughs> okay, so let's look at S1 at this entry. Entry 09, meaning 001001 difference in input to 0001 in the output. If we go backwards, this is this one. You can see that there's two there, so I'll show you the two pairs. Here they are, 33 three and 3a, three this is one pair, and since there's no uh, difference between this pair and the same pair on the other order, you see the other one as well. So we will call it two pairs. Uh, uh, <coughs> in other variants of differential cryptanalysis where the difference is not XO, there might be cases that pairs will not switch and stay inside uh, as the other one. Okay, so we can keep this list behind the original table. So if I go backwards a few slides, put behind the table on the third dimension, below the two, these two pairs, I will have easy access, efficient access to them when I need them. If I look on this entry, 0, 1 to F, we will find entry 4 there, I can go backwards and show you. And Here's the list of all of them. So you see 1e e and 1f, 1f and ye, of course, 2a and 2b, 2b and 2a, these are these pairs. And of course, you will see that the difference between the first and the second in all these cases is, of course, 0, 1, because it's the difference that I promised in advance. Also, we'll keep this behind the entry 4 in the table, and actually we'll keep these lists for all, in all the cases, behind, so it will be easy to access them when needed. I'll show you an example of a simple attack. I'll show you an example how to break three rounds of DES using the idea that I showed you. So let's assume that the difference of both plain texts is this one. This means that the difference in the first round the to, to the F function is this one. This is the value, the difference to which this is, the output of the F function is XOT afterwards. <coughs> Let's assume that this is the difference of the cipher text after three rounds. And we will also give you the two cipher texts. Because once I encrypted the two plain texts, I'll give you the cipher text. Here is the first one, and here is the second one. You can XOR them and see that it's this value. And you can see that I don't care for the plain text because I will not use them anyway. So, given this, I'll show you this picture. So, this is the plain text difference. This is the cipher text difference. Now, if you remember how this is designed, this half is copied to be the input to the first F. Of course, it works also in differences, but as all mentioned, there is the initial permutation somewhere in the beginning. We ignore it. Let's assume it's not there, because the two ciphers with IP and without IP are the, are, have the same security from the point of view of cryptanalysis. You can compute IP if you like and make in inverse IP here and compute the real difference of the plain text. So we know this from here. We know this from here. Therefore, 
this value, x or the output difference here, is this one that we already know, so we can also compute this difference. Now, the input difference here is zero to, the, to f, meaning the output difference of this f is necessarily zero. So we have zero difference here. So this value, x odd with zero here, x odd with this value that, didn't, that we didn't find it, is the ciphertext difference on the, the left half the left half of the ciphertext difference. And therefore, from this equation, we find this difference. So we found all of the internal differences during the, these three rounds, given the plaintext difference and ciphertext difference, in this particular case. Now, this difference is the permutation, the p permutation on 1, 3, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, meaning before application of the p permutation at the end of the f function, we have this value. So for those that forgot how it looks like, this is the value after the p permutation. The value before is here. So the first digit that we have seen, 1 is here, 3 is here, and the rest were 0. So we have one, three, and the rest are zero. So we know that the output difference of S1 in this round is one, zero, 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 one. What's the input difference to S1 here? So if you remember, the, and you forgot, I'll tell you, uh, the input difference to S1 the, is nine. It's one bit zero from here, the four here, which is 0, 1, 0, 0, and the first bit of 8. This is the expansion that all showed and I skip, so believe me, it's 9. Do you remember what happens when we have 9 in the input? 9 is a difference in the input to S1 and 1 in the output as a difference. I've showed you in the previous slide. We have num 2 in the table, and I showed you the two pairs. So, let's see, let's see, we know, we know, again, <laughs> the ciphertext, meaning the ra, we know both ciphertexts, we know the difference of the ciphertext, from the difference of the ciphertext and the difference of the plain text, we successfully computed the difference, the output difference of the last f, and therefore, we found the output difference of, the, of S1 in the last round. On the other hand, <coughs> from the same differences, we found the input difference of S1 in that round. And we know one more thing. We know the two ciphertexts, which means that we know the two ciphertexts, we know the two inputs to F themselves. The two inputs? Of course, the difference. So if I go back to the picture of the function, we know both differences here, and therefore we know both differences here. We know both output differences from the S boxes going backward here. And we know one more thing. We know the real values here, which means we know the real values here after expansion. The only thing that hides the values from being known in the inputs to the S-boxes is this XO. But at this point, I know the real value here of the input. I know the real value here in the input of the S-box. Sorry, I know two choices for this value from the table. And therefore, I can conclude on two values for this part of the key. Since this value that I know for sure, x or this choice of the key, must be the value here. Since I have two choices here, I get choose two choices here by XORing. And therefore, I know two choices for this part of the key. Similarly, I'll find a few choices 
for the next six bits of the key that go into S2. In this case, I'll not get anything on S3, S4, and so on, because there were zeros here, differences zeros, in this case, don't give me anything. All the 64 values can survive. So actually, the low number is good in the differential table? In this, for this attack, you actually want it to... It doesn't matter well. much at this point. It will matter later. Uh, why? Because here, actually here, I got two choices for six bits of the key, which means I... I found information on five bits. So even if it's all I found, so from the 56 bits of the key of this, I had two to the 56 choices, now I have two to the 51. So exhaustive search is faster. But I, go, I want to get better. I don't want us to remain with two choices. I want one choice. What would I do? Another pair. I'll take another pair with other differences. I will need, I will need to keep this half, this zero here, because I used it. Otherwise, I couldn't reconstruct everything here. But as long as I keep this half as different zero, I will get another pair with different differences. And therefore, in the last S1, in the six key bits of the last S1, I'll get a few other possibilities for the key. The real value must appear in both runs. Since here I have two choices, there I probably have four choices, maybe other number. The one that will appear in both is, is the correct one. And nothing says that only S1 can be analyzed this way. Actually, I can analyze all the S boxes of the last round this way. So after two or three pairs, I have one choice for the six key bits of S1, one choice for the six key bits of S2, and so on and so on. Actually, I get one choice for the 48 key bits of the last round. Now the question is how to recover the other eight bits of the key. So make exhaustive search, or there are other techniques, but in this case it's not very interesting. Just two to the eight tests will find the full key. This is the base for everything. I use it later many, many times, all this technique. I know the real inputs to the last F function. I know the output difference of a function. I can recover key bits. And then the question is what I'm doing with them. So here it's the easy case. Everything that I get for the key bits of the last round are surely, sorry, the real key must appear in the list. And therefore, given a few, I just check what appears in all the lists from the first pair, the second pair, and so on, and get the one case for the last subkey. In other, later it will be more complicated. Any questions still here? Okay. Uh, what you see here is, of course, the same things as I said. So I skip. Now, what you've seen, if I go back here, what you've seen here that I use that in 100% of the times, a difference here in the first round will have this output difference. It appears that I can't do it twice. Why can't I do it twice? Because if I have two consecutive rounds with difference zero in the input of a function, this would mean that the two plain texts are the same. And it's not interesting. Therefore, if I want to know something after more than three rounds, I need some other idea. And this idea will be what we'll call characteristics. And in this case, you see an example of a single round characteristic that allows me to know the difference after one round for sure, and the rest I make through analysis. I want to know the difference after two rounds, best after 14 rounds, 
maybe 15. But as I said, I can't do it with 100% success, because the only way to do it for certain is having the zero difference, which is not working for more than one round. So I'll show you a characteristic of two rounds, but with a smaller probability. So let's look at here. V6, if I go backwards to the table, here, V6 is Vc. Let's look at this entry, this 14. Here it is. So, V6 goes to difference E in 14 over 64 of the cases. So, in the rest of the S boxes, we have zero difference in the input, certainly zero difference in the output. So, if this 14 probability, 14 over 64, occurs, we have that this, in, this difference in the plain text. In the right-hand side, you see the input here that we spoke about. On the other side, in the left-hand side, it shows difference to be this one. So this E after the permutation becomes this one. I chose this value to appear here, meaning this one, X or this one, becomes zero. Zero goes always to zero, as we said. So I have something that with probability 14 over 64 will always, so will with probability over 64, become this. So probabilistically, I know that in 16 of 14 over 64 of all possible pairs with this plain text difference, I know the difference of 64 bits of all the 64 bits after two rounds. I get 64 bits differences after two rounds. The probability is quite high, much better than 2 to the minus 64, meaning much better than a random guess of this difference. Uh, and I couldn't do it with real values. I can do it only with differences. With real values, the keys here hide everything. They don't know almost anything on the, the value after two rounds, certainly not more. Can I do better? Okay, let's, let's keep the definitions. Um, I'll just say a few things. When I have two characteristics, I can concatenate them. Sometimes, you remember the swap between the rounds of DES? If the swapped value of the output difference of one characteristic is the same as the non-swapped input value, input difference of the other, I can concatenate them and get a longer one whose probability is, of course, the product of both. Now, I also want to be able to have the notation, the term right pair. A right pair will be a pair that follows all the differences in the characteristic. So, if we we'll go backwards here, a right pair will be a pair that has this difference in the plain text, of course, that's how we start, this difference here, it's certain, it's the first round. This difference here, meaning 14 over 64, a ratio of 14 over 64 of all the pairs will have this difference. And once they have it, certainly they have an extra, have an extra round as well. So a right pair will be one that has all the differences here and here and here and here and everywhere, like in the characteristic. Actually, the probability of the characteristic is the probability that a random pair will be right pair. Uh, okay, so we've seen this one, this characteristic, it's easy. I'll show you another one. This is the next best characteristic. The probability here is 16 over 64. It's using not S1, but S2. 
There are two such ones in this. There's another one that uses a six as the one with a difference. Uh, an S-box in which we have a difference, I call it an active S-box from now on. So it will be easy to, to mention where it is. So S2 here is the active S-box, all the others are not. And this, this one round, single round characteristic will occur with probability quarter. I'll show you now. Here's that one the one that we've seen. I show you now a three round characteristic. I just concatenate it. So I have this one with probability quarter here, meaning the difference here is in one bit, this four. In quarter of the cases, the output difference will be this one. Since I chose here the value the same as here, so the Input difference to the second round is zero, therefore the output difference in the second round must be zero. And now I XOR this value, this one, so I get the same. So you see the last round is just a copy of the first one. It's symmetric around the zero on the top and bottom. So we found that with probability one over 16, this input difference, this plain text difference, will cause this difference, same difference after three rounds. With this characteristic, I can use the previous trick of finding the key, but for five rounds. Now, but there is some small thing to remember. The, since now, when I get a, a choice, if I go back to the attack where I sh showed how to find subkeys of three rounds, now subkey is correct only if the pair that I analyze at this moment is the right pair. Since only one over 16 of the pairs will be run right pairs, so I'll get the right value of the key only on one over 16 of the pairs, and I don't know which is the right pair in advance. So I need to make statistical analysis to guess which it is, meaning to count how many times each subkey was, su was suggested and to take the one that was suggested the most, most frequently. At least one over 16 of the times, the rest will appear less. And this will become more complicated afterwards, yes. You get to five rounds because now you can assume because you know what's going into the... Replace the first round of the three that I showed before by this. Yes, you have at the end. But it becomes realistic. Not every choice of the key that I get is from a right pair, meaning I get much junk. And I need to make the analysis different. The one out of 16 will be. Sorry? The one out of 16 will be. One over? 16. Yeah. But so, this means that I can't ignore, I can't drop everything that was not suggested by some pair. I need to take many pairs, see which value was suggested by one over 16 at least of the data, of the pairs, and hope that I'll be identified between this one and the random noise. And you can see a five round characteristic. Now, you see the first round, the same first round as we had in the previous slide. The middle round is the same middle round as we had in the previous slide. But we added here another round, so the difference here becomes in the input to the first round. This value, this value x ord with this value becomes this one. With probability 10 times 16 over 64 square, uh, we get this bit, which becomes, which clears this one, so we get zero. And since now everything is symmetric. So, with probability about 1 over 10,000, we'll know the data after five rounds. Actually, this is the 
characteristic that we will use later to show you how to find keys of eight round reduced DS. This is not the best characteristic of, this is not the highest probability characteristic of DS. There is one with a higher probability, about one over 9,956 9, or something like that. But due to various details, it's less useful. So, any questions still here? Okay, what will happen if we want six rounds? So, the easiest thing is to ask how to add another round here, meaning this value, x or this value, meaning this, this difference will be the input difference to the sixth round. And if you make the, if you make the computation, you will see that it will create a factor of about 100 in the probability, meaning the best probability you can have with this input difference is about 1 over 100. So if you have six rounds, it will be about 1 over a million. Seven rounds, it will be about 1 over 100 million. <coughs> and let's see. We had one, we had probability one. Two rounds, we had probability quarter. Three, one over 16. Four, the best one, you didn't see, but it's about 100 <coughs> over 800. Then one over 10,000, one over a million. And you can see that it grows about exponentially. Okay. You say that the best characteristic is the best one that we know, or you... you it's the best. We've proven... The five, the, the one that I mentioned there, uh, with one over 9,000, it's the best. It's the highest. We, 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 there is an algorithm that finds the best ones. Okay. Uh, so, you see here that it's grow, the probability reduces about exponentially, meaning after seven rounds it will be about one over 100 million, about two to the minus 27. If you take nine rounds, it would probably be two to the minus 40. Eleven rounds would probably be two to the minus 50 something. Not useful for anything anymore because there's only 56 qubits. Anything below 2 to the 56, 2 to the minus 56 is not useful. Certainly, anything below 2 to the minus 64 is not useful here because the whole set of possible plaintexts or pairs is 2 to the 55 pairs. 2 to the 50, so 2 to the 63 pairs or 2 to the 64 plaintexts. So when the probability is reduced, it's not helpful anymore. So this trick, this trick of taking the best characteristic with fewer rounds and extend it in some way, either by adding rounds at the end or at the middle, is not useful. Can we do better? And I'll give you a hint. Can we find a characteristic or a set of characteristics where when we add an additional round or two more rounds, the loss in probability is constant. Every two more rounds, we lose same factor in probability. It's not here. Here we lose more and more with every round. What should I have? I want to concatenate a new characteristic to the end of the previous best one and lose a constant factor every time I do that. What will I get? I get an iterative characteristic. The question is, can I have an iterative characteristic, meaning every two rounds I get the same difference to which I'll be able to iterate the same characteristic? Okay, so I'll show it in the board. Let's... Let's assume... Let's assume 
that we have some difference at the beginning. Let's call it L prime and R prime, just for simplicity of notation. And I want that after two rounds, I have the same L prime here, meaning L prime here, and the same R prime here after two rounds. So what, what do I know? So if you see R prime goes here, X ordered by the output here, the output difference here, becomes R prime. So this must be zero. Similarly, this must be zero. So the two output differences from the a function must be zero. Of course, I prefer high probabilities, so I choose the input difference zero as well, but I can do it only once. In the second time, I can't, because the two plaintext would be the same. So I need to choose another one. Let's call it Psi. So the question is, are there differences Psi in the input of a function with a fixed key so that the output difference is zero? If you look carefully at the definitions of DES, nobody claims that for a fixed key, the f function is one to one. It's not. And therefore, certainly there are. There are. There might be outputs that for a particular key can't occur at all, and some others that will occur several times. We want to find those that will have as many pairs as possible with a fixed Psi input difference that will have the same output. So I'll not, come, I'll not show you in much detail how it's possible to find them. I'll just say that the design of this cipher had in mind that it should be hard to find such differences, Psi. Meaning, it's not possible to have Psi which activates only one S-box meaning seven inputs, <laughs> uh, input difference zero to seven S-boxes, and only non-difference, the input difference to one of them. Also, it's not possible with two S-boxes. In order to be able to find such a Psi, it must activate three S-boxes. This means that the probabilities cannot be very high, because if it's only in one S-box, the probability would be two over 64 at worst, Possibly 4 over 64 or higher. Cool, uh, Senator? So, if you take this psi, if you take this psi, this psi activates three S-boxes, S1, S2, and S3. I can show you which bits in each and, and show you that uh, it's possible that the output difference will, is, will be zero. You can go to the table and check. Um, this has probability 1 over 234. Now, if I look at this, Psi, I can now do the following. The first round is zero to zero. The second one is Psi to zero. With this probability, this is zero. Zero X or zero will give me zero in the next input difference. Therefore, I'll get in the third round also zero at the output difference. I'll get Psi to the fourth round. With this probability again, I'll get zero here and therefore zero in the fifth round, therefore psi in the sixth round, with probability one over 234, I'll get zero again, and so on and so on, as many rounds as I wish. So here it is, you see the characteristic with this difference, with this psi. Actually there are two psi's with this probability, the other one is listed here. 
It's best to use both when we make the analysis in some way, and skip it now. And, okay, and we can iterate it as many times as we wish. Therefore, we get the following probabilities. For three rounds, meaning zero, psi, zero, this is the probability of three rounds, we get 1 over 234, it's much worse than the one I showed you before. For five rounds, it would be twice psi in the second and fourth rounds. And therefore, this would be the probability. It's still much worse than we had before. But since seven rounds, it's the best. For seven rounds, it's the best characteristic possible. There's no better one. And for nine rounds, it's 2 to the, to, two to the minus 31.5. And then we have 2 to the minus 39 in 11 rounds. In 13 rounds, this is important, we have 2 to the minus 47, or 47.2. We'll use it later. And this is why this the complexity of attacking DES by uh, differential trip analysis is 2 to the 47. And even in 15 rounds, you see, it's still 2 to the minus 55. In 16 rounds and more, it's not useful because just uh, the, the time that we need to choose random plain texts until we find the first right pair will be more than regular exhaustive search. Any questions? Yes? This property that allows the um, iter iterative characteristics, is it possible to avoid it if you had a final cycle with a different f function? Or is this specifically because of this f function? Um, Iterative characteristic can be of various kinds. This is a simple one. You can have zero at the output in both, in both, in two rounds. And you can, if you would change the F function, of course, you will need to search for the best characteristics of the new cipher. In some cases, this type of two round iteration would not be the best one. Some ciphers would, for example, decide that the, the f function would be bijective, meaning no output difference zero. They may have other problems. But in that case, I can show you ciphers with four round iterative characteristics or three round iterative characteristics of other kinds. Now, the question is not what to do against iterative characteristic of this particular one, it's what to do to ensure that the best characteristic will have a very low probability, as much as possible. Uh, it's, not the, it's not the only question. Some, sometimes, some attacks use the fact that there are characteristics with very low probability, zero. So, I'm not sure them here, but uh, we should remember that any change from randomness or from um, average will help the attacker, might help the attacker. So we want to make it as much as possible uh, unified, that all the possibilities will look the same, because once I can identify something different in different in the cipher, I can use it later. So not only high probabilities, also low probabilities might be worse, might be bad. Anyway, uh, this is just one kind of iterative characteristic. There are others that I can show you and that exist in other, in other ciphers. Even in DES, there are other, other ones, but the probabilities are lower. You said that the 13 rounds is why the full DES is 2 to the 47 complexity. You showed us that you can actually add two rounds by what you did, but you need to add three more rounds here, so what do you do? Hmm. Attacking 16 rounds is tricky, but you can see all the details in the slides, and since I want to show it to you, 
So and I will not be able to do it uh, till the break. I'll do it afterwards and skip other material. You already know it. Uh, but uh, I'll, sh I'll try to show it. There are other tricks. I didn't show all the tricks. Actually, I didn't show you how to find keys in, uh, in, except for one simple case. No questions? Because now I'll go to show you how to find keys. Uh, okay. But before that, I just want to mention that I, I looked at characteristics and said that right pairs are those with all the differences as suggested by the characteristic. But as you will see later, in many cases we don't use the internal, the intermediate differences for anything. So this means that the characteristic is used, but then I use only the plaintex difference and the output difference at the end without caring in what path it went through during encryption. Meaning, if there are two characteristics with the same plaintext difference and at the same output difference at the end, they both sum up with their probabilities. So I get even better results, since I don't care about the intermediate differences usually. In such a case, I'll call it a differential. A differential is the same as a characteristic, but I don't care about the intermediate path. Just the plaintex difference and the output difference at the end. And uh, um, actually, characteristics are usually used as lower bounds for, for the probability of the differentials, and you usually use differentials in the attack. But there are some attacks where we really use characteristics. Okay, so just as an example, a, 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 a good example, I'll show you how to break eight rounds of DES. So the cipher is now a DES reduced to eight rounds. Uh, so I'll just show you the cipher again. I'll show you the cipher again. By chance, you see here eight rounds. So first round, second round, so on. We, I showed you a characteristic of five rounds. So the characteristic will be set here in the first five rounds of the cipher. That's where the characteristic is. So I know the output difference here with probability one over 10,000. So I know the difference here in the input to the sixth round with probability one over 10,000. I know all the 64 bits with this probability. Now the question is, what do I do? So I, I told you in, in, earlier, I need to know the difference here. The difference here in the input in the, of the first round is easy. It's just part of the cipher text. Both inputs here are also known as parts of the cipher text. So if I needed in the attack on the three rounds that I showed you earlier, the two inputs, which means also the input difference, I, I know it here. And I also need to know this. Now, as I said, there are several problems here. One of them is that even if I be able to compute it, it will assume that the characteristic holds, meaning it's a right pair. If it's not, all my computations are noise. Useless. I don't know if they are old. The other one is that give I in three rounds here. If I had only two rounds, if a characteristic would end here, <coughs> then from the difference here and the difference here that I know, I could compute, let's see, the difference here is known, meaning here. I know this data, I know the difference here from the last, from the ciphertext, and I could compute the, the value that I need. But I can't do it in three rounds. In three rounds, I know this value. When it's, ex when it's XORed with the output difference here, and the output difference here to become the ciphertext left half difference, 
which means that I actually know the XOR of this value and this value, but not which is which. Not, not even what they are, just the XOR of them. But I want to know themselves. So I'll have to look at the characteristic again. Let's look at the characteristic again. Let's look at the characteristic. So, that's the playtext difference. After five rounds, I get this value. This is the value that will become the input difference to round six. If you look carefully at this input difference, you see many zeros. Actually, if you look carefully at this input difference and think about it as the input to function f, you will see that the difference in the input to S1 is not zero. S1 must be active. I don't know what's the output difference there. If I would select the output difference there, and in all the other S boxes, then it will become part of a characteristic. It will be probabilistic. The probability of a characteristic of six rounds will be, as we said, at least, uh, at most, one over a million. I don't want it. So this is active. In S3 and S4, it's active. And if you look carefully, you'll see that in S2, the input is zero. This zero with one bit from here and one bit from here, it's both zero. And in S5, S6, S7, and S8, it's zero as well. Also, the bits that come from the neighboring S boxes are zero in this case. So we have five S boxes in round six, which are certainly not active. And therefore, I can consider them, if you wish, as known in some sense. So we know the value here. It's XORed with a value from the output difference of the sixth round, of which the output differences of five S boxes, meaning 20 bits, are certainly zero. So I know 20 bits here for certain. I know 20 bits here for certain. When XORed with ciphertext cipher difference, I know 20 bits here for certain, which are very, they are the outputs of S2, S5, S6, and S7, and S8. Clearly, when I say for certain, I mean assuming that this is the right pair. So, if this is the right pair, I know here 20 bits, the output of five S boxes. I know the two inputs here. It looks like I can make the same analysis as before. I know the two inputs, I know the output difference. I can get suggested keys by the same trick as I had before, going to the table, get the value there, X or with the um, inputs to the F function, find suggestions for the key. But now, not all the Values will be, so not every pair will suggest the real keys. <coughs> Actually, only one over 10,000 pairs will suggest the real key. So let's look about what we did before. Earlier, Earlier, we made analysis on the last round. We made analysis on the last round, found the six key bits of S1, and looked which appear in all the pairs. Okay, let's make the computation. Um, let's assume that we take 100,000 pairs, and ask how many times the real value of the key will appear and how many times the noise, every other value will appear. So we have 100,000 pairs. Each one 
in S1, so not in S1, in S2, we'll have, uh, I know the two inputs, so the input difference in the, to the last F function will be about random, in some row of the table, but I will know in which when I look at this uh, pair of ciphertexts. Uh, I know the output difference, so I look to the table, in, at the table, see what's the value. The average value will be four. So each of the 100,000 pairs will suggest four six-bit keys. Now, the wrong, sorry, and the result will be keys of six bits. So in each entry for each possible six bit value, we will get this value. How much it is? Um, 25,000. So each one key will get 25,000 hits. The right key will get same 25,000 hits because it will also be suggested at random by whole pairs. Plus, how many? How many right pairs are there that must give the right value? 10,000 keys, so 10,000 pairs. Probability of a right pair is 1 over 10,000. 10. Can we identify? No. Not good. So, I can't do that. Okay. Let's change color. Any idea? Instead, let's look at all the five S boxes simultaneously. We have five S boxes to which we know the differences. So we have 100,000 pairs. Now, each pair suggests four choices for the six of S2, four choices for the six of S5, four choices for the six bits of S6, and so on. So 10 times 4 to the power 5. Now, since I now analyze all the five sets of six bits simultaneously, I actually analyze 30 bits of subkey. I will count how many times each 30 bits each value of 30 bits is suggested. Not on each S book separately, but all of them together. So it's over 64 to the power of 5. What's the result? The real value how many times will be suggested? Same value plus the 30 bits of the real value of these 30 bits of the key. How many times will they be suggested? At random, they will be suggested the same number as anybody else. But the right pairs will suggest them correctly, meaning they will be suggested 10 more times on average. Can we identify between this and that? Yes. yes, we can. So we'll make all this analysis, have an array of two to 30 entries, one for each of the 30 bits, or for each 30 bit suggested key, and we'll search for the highest. Actually, you can see that we don't need 10 right pairs, meaning much less than 10, 100,000 pairs are needed. 
and there are various tricks to reduce it further. And if you want to go further, uh, we can do it with analyzing only three bits together, meaning uh, 18 bits at a time, and then find the rest of the 12. So it's possible to do with less memory. You don't need 2 to the 30 memory, but this is just an extreme case. Did anybody understand anything? Nobody says yes, so... Who understood? Oh, a few. Should I repeat it again? So in the slides, uh, you will see all of that, all this description here, all the computation is found here. Now, what you have seen, what you have seen is a case to which we call three R attacks. So I go backwards in the slide. I call it three R attacks, meaning in addition to the characteristic, we add three additional rounds, and this is the trick how to add three additional rounds. We can do two R attacks. Two R attacks, if you like, is the case of three rounds that I showed at the beginning, a characteristic of, in this case, probability one in the first round, and the rest, we have two further rounds of analysis. It's possible also to have one R attack. As as we may use more rounds in addition to the characteristic, it's more and more complicated to identify the data that we need. If I use one R attack, let's say zero R attack. Zero R attack, the characteristic and the cipher are of the same length, same number of rounds, meaning I know everything. I can check the cipher text difference against the characteristic cipher text difference, and if it's not the same, it's a wrong pair. If it's the same, it's expected to be a right pair. Uh, if I do a two-hour attack, I can't identify this way anything. I can't share, uh, compare the ciphertext difference to the difference to the output difference of a characteristic. In one hour attack, because it's only around the round, half of a ciphertext difference is the same as half, the other half of the characteristics output difference. So I can have comparison and discard various, many wrong pairs. The identification of wrong pairs during <laughs> analysis is very important because it reduces much of the noise that we have. We have much, much noise here, and as much as we can discard noise here is better. If we look, at the attack that I just showed you, I didn't show you anything on round seven. What happens in round seven? In round seven, I know something about the input difference. I know the output difference of round seven, and I could, for example, check in each S box in this round whether the input difference can cause the output difference, meaning, in the corresponding table, the value is not zero. If it's zero, certainly it's a wrong pair, and we can discard it. So the identification of wrong pairs by various uh, information that we have during the various rounds, from the cipher text difference and from comparing it to the characteristic, is very important. In some cases, for example, zero R attack or one R attack, it's easier. In three R attacks, it's very complicated. We don't have much data to do it. But since uh, it's better, it looks better to use three R attacks over zero R attacks. Why? Because the characteristic is shorter, just five rounds, not eight. Therefore, the probability is higher, therefore we need less data. As you, you had seen, the best characteristic of eight rounds is with probability 2 to the minus 24, which would mean that to find the first right pair, you would need 16 million pairs. So five round attack that I just showed 
needs less clearly we want to use and as a characteristic which is at the shortest possible because it has the highest probability. Okay, so I'll ask a question. And the question will be, everything I showed is a chosen plain text attack. Actually, I didn't say that, so I'll say it now. It's a chosen plain text attack. I said before that I don't need to know the plain texts. If you look carefully, I never used them. I used the fact that I know the difference of the two plain texts. I never used the plain texts themselves, the real data in there. Actually, I don't need them. But it's a chosen plain text because I need to ask somebody to encrypt pairs with this difference. Non plain text would give me random data and nobody tells me that I have these differences at all. So what I want to show you now is that in some circumstances, we can convert this attack into a non plain text attack. We'll pay a big, a huge price for that. The complexity, sorry, the amount of data that we will need will grow by much. But the idea will be the following. Let's look at an attack that needs two pairs. Let's think about the original attack with three rounds that we showed before. An attack that requires two pairs, or one pair even. How can I find one pair? So, so, uh, I should. Probably you've seen everything now. Um, switch it off, it will not switch the slides. Um, how can I find a pair with a particular difference that I need by non plain text? Birthday paradox. If I wait enough, two plain text in the set will have this difference. Now, what do I mean two plain texts in the set? Usually when you speak about the birth of the paradox, we want two same values in the set. In this case, I want two values which differ by some difference. But if you look carefully at the birth day paradox, it's the same, up to probably a very small constant of small, smaller than square root two or something like that. And so by the birthday paradox, after square root of the plain text space, about square root of the plain text space, we'll have this pair. And then we can use the original attack on this pair. Okay, what will I do if I need two plain texts, two pairs for the attack? So the birthday paradox, the extended version of the birthday paradox will tell us that in order to find two pairs for the attack, we need square root two times more data than for finding one. So we will wait till we find two in the big data, in the known plain text that we choose, meaning we need slightly more than the square root of the plain text space, and we will get the data that we need. In this attack, we needed 100,000, let's say 100,000. Actually, this attack can work with 20,000. 100,000 pairs. So, the extended version of the birthday paradox will tell us that we can do it. It will cost us more, but we will be able to do it. So, let me turn it off. Okay. So, the idea says the following. Given, assume that we have a chosen plain text attack that requires M pairs. This attack does not need to know the plain text themselves. It does not select a particular plain text. 
It selects many plain texts with a particular difference, and it doesn't care about the plain texts themselves. So the idea says, ask for two to the 32, it's uh, the square root of a plain text space, times square root of 2m, a random known plain text, where m is the number of pairs needed by the chosen plain text attack. Therefore, if you look carefully at this set, let's call this number x, you have x times x minus 1 over 2 possible pairs inside. Each one against all the others over 2, of course. So, this number squared over 2, what is it? Let's see. Uh, 2 to the 64 times 2m over 2, meaning 2 to the 64 times m. Since it's random plain text, the outputs will be random. Let's assume they are uh, uniformly distributed, the outputs. So each possible output value will appear 1 over 64, 1 over 2 to the 64 of the cases. So we had 2 to the 64 times m pairs here. When I divide it by 2 to the 64, I'll get that I have about m pairs for each <coughs> plain text difference, in particular for the one that we need. And then we will use this, these pairs for the, with, with, with the original attack. So you will ask me, is it? Efficient? No, it's not. <coughs> you say for two pairs we need about 2 to the 33 in the case of 64 blo bit blocks. Instead of 8, it will be 2 to the 34. Instead of 2 to the 15, it will be 2 to the 40, which is about what we need for uh, the attack on eight rounds that I've just showed. But if you see attacks that require higher complexities, the difference is much smaller <coughs> between the non plain text conversion and the original attack. I'll just say one more word. There are ciphers for which this non plain text conversion is the best non plain text attack known till this day. There are good, low complexity chosen plain text attacks and nobody found a good known plain text attack. So we have chosen, we don't have known, so this, is, this conversion is the best known for these ciphers. It's quite rare, because if the ciphers are not so good, there are probably some other ways to find known plain text attacks against them. But it's possible that this conversion is the best. Any questions till now? because I was told that you want lunch, and we have three minutes, and uh, since you don't ask any question, so I'll tell you that everything I said so far is not working against 16 rounds of DS. Because, let's see, if we use a 15 round characteristic against 16 rounds of DS with one R attack, uh, the probability of a characteristic would be 2 to the minus 55, meaning we will need at least, to find the first right pair, we'll need 2 to the 55 pairs, which means 2 to the 56 chosen plain text. Therefore, it means that my enemy will need to work at the cost of exhaustive search instead of me doing that, but I will not gain anything in total complexity. Uh, I like very much that my enemy will work for me, but he will want, not want to, probably. Okay, what about 14 rounds? The probability is 2 to the minus 54. We will gain slightly, it's not much. It's clearly one right pair is not enough anyway, so it's still too high. So, what about 13 rounds of characteristic? Okay, 
When we make the analysis with 13 rounds, iterative characteristic with probability 2 to the minus 47, that I showed you, put them in the first 13 rounds and make the analysis with a free R attack like we did in the case of eight rounds of the S, you'll see that this attack doesn't work. Why? Because the probabilities are too low. It doesn't work. And then the question is, what to do? If you look at, at attacks on 15 rounds of DES, you'll see that we can break 15 rounds of DES using characteristics of 14 rounds, and we can find the key of 15 rounds, but the complexity will be very close to exhaustive search. Um, but 16 rounds means characteristics of 13 rounds, and in this, in, with uh, so low probabilities, it's impossible to add three rounds afterwards and make the analysis. So then the question is, what to do afterwards? And uh, you'll hear it after lunch. <laughs>